Hi everyone, I'm Debbie from Property Apprentice. Join me today for the Week in Review where I'll talk about current events for the everyday investor and home buyer. And for those of you that are watching on YouTube, there's the catch. Our topics for this week, first up we've got from landlords.co.nz on the 13th of September, one-way traffic for the Real Estate Institute in New Zealand's housing report. Second up from News Hub on the 15th of September, GDP, GDP figures, New Zealand avoids a recession after 1.7% quarterly growth recorded. Third topic, good returns 13th of September, difficulties with debt on the rise from Centric. And fourth topic, stuff on the 13th of September, of course, the guy selling houses would say it's not going to go down anymore. Last but not least, one roof on the 10th of September, listing prices are up, prices are down. Can first home buyers get ahead? So first up, we've got from Landlords on the 13th of September, one-way traffic for the Real Estate Institute in New Zealand's housing report. The Rhines House Price Index fell another 1.4% in August. The median house price across the country of 800000 was down by the same rate as the HPI in August. Increasingly expensive debt servicing and higher mortgage rates continue to affect the market this year. Median residential property price for New Zealand, excluding Auckland, remained unchanged compared to last year at 700000 and there was a month-on-month -month drop of 2.8% from 720000 Four regions had an annual decline in the median price last month. Six of Auckland's seven territorial authorities had negative annual growth. Waitakere had the greatest decline, followed by Auckland City. In Wellington, the median price was down 9.3% annually from 860000 to 780000 last month. The Manawatu Whanganui region was down 6.6% from 610,000 to 570,000, and Northland had a drop of 1.2% from 650,000 down to 642,000. All other regions had annual increases in the median price. West Coast recorded the greatest percentage increase in the median price, up 25% from 280,000 to 350,000. The median price in Marlborough increased 14.5% from 585000 to 670000 and Gisborne had a median price increase of 13.2% from 500000 to 566000 According to Ryan's Chief Executive, Jen Baird, the median price across New Zealand has dropped by 9.6% in the last six months. Wellington's had a decline of 21.6% from 995,000 in February 2022 to 780,000 this month. These are the greatest six month drops since Ryan's began recording in 1992. Sales activity remains subdued, although median property prices are easing across the country and supplies increasing, buyers are wary of rising interest rates and inflation. However, some real estate agents have reported seeing more people attending open homes. While owner occupiers are currently the dominant force in the market, first home buyers are starting to re emerge. Baird believes that the relaxing of the Credit Contracts and Consumer Finance Act, or the Triple CFA, and the opportunity to negotiate are encouraging first home buyers despite affordability issues. Kiwi Bank said it's hard to find good news from within the latest housing market data, but there are early signs that the trough in house prices might be on the horizon. Senior economist Jeremy Couchman said that the 4,891 sales recorded by Ryan's in August were up almost 8% compared to July, seasonally adjusted. Compared to last August, sales were 18% lower but up from the 35% year-on-year drop recorded in July. He said it's important to keep in mind that an annual comparison of sales from August to September will be distorted because of last year's COVID lockdowns. Nevertheless, sales are an indicator of house price movements, which loosely lead to house price growth by about six months. Couchman's expecting house prices to fall 13% further by the end of the year, but a 13% trough would only take the house price index back to a level seen at the start of 2021. They anticipate a gradual recovery in prices from early next year, as new housing supply would outstrip new housing demand. Despite past lockdowns caused by the Delta virus, 
Buyers seem to have the upper hand as the level of housing supply remains high by recent standards. And in addition, the median number of days to sell has risen to 49 days in August. This is a full 10 days above the long run average. So a couple of comments from me about, about this article. First of all, it's important to understand how median values work and that they can easily be skewed either up or down depending on the types of properties that are sold in any given month. So we prefer to look at the house price index and the Ryan's house price index is a good one, the Real Estate Institute of New Zealand. And secondly, when it comes to looking at uh, increasing demand, we are certainly noticing that with our free events. So we've had an increase in the number of people that have registered for our free events recently. And because we've been in business for 12 years and a little bit more than 12 years now, uh, we've, we've certainly seen that the attendance at our free events tends to be an early indicator as to changes in the property market consumer behavior and things like that. So generally speaking, when we see an increased number of attendees at our free events, a few months later, the property market starts to actually show real evidence of recovery in the, in the prices. Okay, so we have yet to see whether the increase is purely because we've entered spring, which normally sees an increase in, in market activity as well. So hindsight will have the benefit of 2020 vision, but those are gut feeling instincts based on what we're seeing for registrations at our events. Second topic from News Hub on the 15th of September, GDP figures New Zealand avoids recession after a 1.7% quarterly growth recorded. So Stats New Zealand has announced a 1.7% lift in GDP, which means New Zealand has effectively avoided a recession for the time being at least. There were initial fears that the latest figures could reveal that the economy was in a technical recession, meaning two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. However, the jump in the second quarter of this year means a recession has been successfully dodged. The contributing factors for economic growth include the reopening of the borders, lowering of COVID-19 restrictions, and near record low unemployment. One of the main contributors to growth was the services industries, which had a 2.7% increase in growth. In the June 2022 quarter, households and international visitors spent more for dining out, sports, transport, accommodation, and recreational activities. Overall, household spending for goods like motor vehicles and audiovisual equipment declined by 3.2%. There's also been a similar fall in retail trade activity. The United States and the United Kingdom both came in with 0.1% falls in their second quarters, while Australia saw 0.9% growth. The OECD total was a 0.4% lift. ASB's Mark Smith said further volatility lies ahead for the New Zealand economy as it transitions back towards pre-COVID-19 norms. He expects the country to remain in a steady momentum due to its underlying resilience and the support factors in the economy. Council of Trade Unions economist Craig Rennie said that while the figures show the current strength of the economy, there is a pattern of slower growth. And although there is strong growth within the travel, tourism, accommodation and hospitality industries, manufacturing, construction and agriculture were falling behind. In order to attain a balanced recovery, all areas of the economy need to grow. Economists were predicting a slight growth. The Reserve Bank in August said it expected the GDP to have rebounded with a 1.8% lift. Prior to the figure's release, ANZ downgraded its forecast from 1% growth to just 0.4%, while Westpac went the other way, moving from a prediction of 1% to 1.8%. The GDP growth this quarter is softer than expected as the economy struggles to acquire resources. Independent economist Cameron Bagri said New Zealand has essentially taken two steps forward, two steps backward after the GDP rose 3% in the fourth quarter of 2021. There's been stagnation in supply because of an inadequate labour force and poor productivity. Bagri expects the situation to remain the same over the next 12 months as monetary policy will continue to buy. And in a speech earlier on Thursday morning, Finance Minister Grant Robertson said that New Zealand is not immune from global issues like supply chain disruptions and a slowing Chinese economy. 
He added that forecasting, even as we move to the next chapter of this one in 100 year pandemic, remains more of an art than a science. If you want to learn more about the property market, join me at one of our free Beginner's Guide to Property Investment events. We hold them online or in person in our office in Ellerslie in Auckland. Check out propertyapprentice.co.nz for upcoming dates and register today. And if you'd like to find out more about how we can help you to reach your financial goals, I will tell you about that at the end of the free events as well. But you can also book a no obligation phone call or meeting with my husband, Paul Roberts, via the website propertyapprentice.co.nz as well. Topic number three, good returns, 13th of September, difficulties with debt on the rise, Centrix. Centrix has revealed that stressful economic conditions are starting to catch up with people's finances. The agency cites high cost of living, increased interest rates and a tougher economic climate as reasons why customers are struggling to repay debt all over the country. Centrix reveals debt information every month and its latest report lists some significant developments. It shows arrears in consumer debt rose 13% in the year to July, while arrears on unsecured personal loans rose 7.9%. There were also rises in arrears for buy now pay later deals, along with an increased number of credit card payments that have slipped past their due date. Vehicle arrears also rose for the fourth consecutive month. Centrix says this is significant because vehicles are usually amongst the last debt finance purchase that people default on. Centrix said mortgage arrears seem to have escaped this trend as people are generally more concerned about keeping a roof over their heads rather than retaining a vehicle, especially, I would suggest, in a period where a lot of places across the country there's a dire shortage of rental properties. So if someone loses their home, they could very well have difficulty finding a rental property. And they'll add to the list of people that are sleeping in those cars if they have still got them or sleeping in tents if they've got one of those while they're on that massive waiting list for emergency accommodation. However, there have been fewer people taking out home loans in general. Mortgage applications for first homes are down 25% year on year. First home buyers are taking out smaller mortgages, which is great news for them, probably largely in part to the fact that house prices have been falling. The average mortgage has dropped by $65,000 in the past six months. And that's down from a peak average mortgage of $600,000 in January this year. Centrix data also reveals that the commercial sector is also taking a hit as businesses struggle with supply chain issues, labour shortages and reduced consumer spending. A word of advice from Centrix to debtors is to focus on managing repayments. If paying becomes challenging, consumers should speak with their lenders sooner rather than later. Fourth topic, stuff on the 13th of September. Of course, the guy selling houses would say it's not going to slow down anymore. The view of some real estate agents that the arrival of spring would bring in more buyer activity and higher sales volumes has been called good marketing by Westpac Acting Chief Economist Michael Gordon. Even though historically, spring does tend to increase activity. We've seen that over the last decades and I'm not selling any houses. So that's just uh, purely experience in the property market. But Michael Gordon said that interest rates will dictate how much people can afford and are willing to spend. There's still a way to go before seller expectations and market realities align, in his opinion. While things start to pick up in spring, the trend goes towards sales peaking in March and May. Ray White, Carpenter Realty's owner, Glenn Carpenter, agreed that anyone saying spring would bring price stabilisation was engaged in marketing. His concern is for house prices to continue on a downward trajectory. Carpenter had heard of some sellers removing their unsold properties from the market with the intention of relisting in warmer weather. He says this is dangerous as sellers will be faced with more competition from other sellers. If interest rates continue to rise, which they're currently predicted to do, it meant selling when supply was at its peak and demand was even lower. His advice for spring sellers is to launch in September in order to get ahead of sellers who don't enter the market until later in October or November. According to him, historical trends support his suggestion. From the previous recessions of 1997 and the 2008 global financial crisis, sellers waited four or five years for the market to recover. If things got worse, selling's now good. 
And obviously that depends on whereabouts you were in New Zealand because some parts of the country recovered from the GFC in a much shorter time frame, just two to three years. Real Estate Institute Chief Executive Jen Baird said salespeople who were part of her organisation were reporting a rise in open home and auction attendance and the number of home appraisals. That does um, back up what I was just saying about the number of people that are attending our free events. There does appear to be an increase in the amount of interest from the general public in New Zealand. So Jean Baird said this usually caused a modest increase in median sales prices, but she wouldn't predict if this pattern stays the same this year in the form of higher prices, a stabilisation or a slowing in price declines. What she notes is that headwinds that are fundamental to the property market, such as rising interest rates, inflation and global economic uncertainty will continue to affect the market. Westpac's report said declines in sales volumes and house prices would be consistent with the increase in the average number of days to sell, as well as anecdotes of the increase in the number of unsold homes. The bank is forecasting further OCR hikes in October and November, bringing the cash rate to 4%. ASB also reaffirmed its prediction of a 12% house price fall. ASB's economists said there was clear evidence to suggest the market is on the turn. Fifth topic for this week in review, we've got from One Roof on the 10th of September. Listings are up, prices are down, can first home buyers get ahead? First home buyers are coming out of a slumber, although home ownership is still challenging. Tweaks to government regulations and home loan schemes, however, have eased the pain after a difficult few years. The loosening of stringent triple CFA lending rules have seen newbies grab opportunities to apply for home loans. Those rules are due for another set of changes, although they won't be taking place until March. Some think this isn't soon enough, as banks have been too meticulous with examining bank statements to the point of stopping many first home buyers in their tracks. However, a win for first home buyers is the removal of first home loan caps nationwide and the increase of the price caps for first home grants. But even with the triple CFA changes in the housing market favouring first home buyers, many say that buyers shouldn't take too long to make up their minds as the housing market can flip quickly. And if it flips back to a seller's market, first home buyers might struggle again by competing with other buyers. Caveats to the good news for first home buyers is not just high inflation and rising interest rates, but the fact that banks are testing people's ability to repay mortgages at much higher rates. Rupert Goff, CEO and owner of the Mortgage Lab, says interest rates are a really big problem in the first home buyer market because higher rates mean people lose a significant amount of their buying power. Goff also says people haven't grasped the magnitude of geographical barriers being removed from the first home loan price caps, saying anyone earning less than $150,000 can access the first home loan scheme and with a low deposit. Economist Benji Patterson, however, urges caution about buying far from home just for the sake of getting on the property ladder. He said there have been people who bought in places they don't want to live in. They weren't really interested in buying in a certain area and they were only driven to buy a house at all costs. If they were entering the market now with the FOMO gone, they might not have felt the pressure to uproot themselves. Patterson also says first-time buyers should work out their own mortgage repayment, work out their budget on very high interest rates, regardless of whatever the bank's short-term stress test rates are, because anything can happen. My personal opinion is that everyone should be checking their own cash flow if mortgage rates hit 7 or 7.5% 7 on principal and interest. While inflation may have grabbed headlines with stories of people cutting back on spending, Patterson says the bigger challenge is when people have to refix their mortgages because this means they need to find a lot more money to pay back their loan. Mortgage broker Solomon Kurukontala from the loan market notices a return of interest from first home buyers and a change in their psyche. They're coming back more educated and more accepting of the higher interest rates, whereas at the beginning of the year, they were shocked at how much they were soaring. There's also been a shift in home buyers shopping around among brokers instead of relying on banks. People are also realizing there's no point stretching their budgets to the maximum of their loan approval. Developers are becoming more realistic when it comes to selling at fair price. And James Wilson, head of valuations for One Roof Starter Partner Velocity, 
says first home buyers who think they can't afford to buy a home should not be swayed by advice from mum and dad or family, but should talk to their bank or a broker. However, he cautions that first home buyers shouldn't wait on the market to fall further. Prices may drop further for a second, but it could also easily pick up again within a short period of time. The ASB's chief economist, Nick Tuffley, says he sees two big positives for first home buyers at the moment. One is house prices are likely to keep falling into the early parts of next year, and the other is the disappearance of the FOMO factor. So thank you for joining me for this week's Week in Review. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to find out more about the property market and how you can reduce the risk when you are investing in property, join me at one of our free Beginner's Guide to Property Investment events available online or in person in our office in Ellerslie. Check out propertyapprentice.co.nz for upcoming dates and register today. And if you want to learn more about how we can help you to reach your financial goals, you can book a no obligation phone call or meeting with my husband, Paul Roberts. You can do that through the website as well, propertyapprentice.co.nz. Thanks for listening and I'll see you again shortly.